Welcome to this week's episode of Trista's Plate Story Podcast. I'm Trista Polo from IWokeUpAwesome.com, and I am your host. Each week, we learn the story behind that vanity plate, the one you saw driving down the road. What did it say? What did it mean? Why did they choose it? This week, we meet Joey and his 1963 antique mini, Mini Me Too. Joey shares the story of Mini Me and how restoring him to his original beauty helped him through some very tough times his family faced. After a two and a half year battle of childhood leukemia, his daughter is well, and their family now volunteers helping other families navigate what can be an uncertain and difficult time. Mini Me was not just a successful restoration project. Like many who live in Los Angeles, he's always looking for the next acting job. He is a working car and can be hired for movies, commercials, photo shoots, and even chase scenes. Check out the video version to see Mini Me in all his glory. And if you'd like to reach the organization Joey's family supports and volunteers with, you can visit www.maxloveproject.org. Now let's go meet Joey. Welcome. I'm really excited to have this week's Plate Story guest on. It's Joey Arellano from Monrovia, California, which is in Los Angeles County. And the license plate, if you're watching on video, you can see is Mini Me Too. Now, when we first connected, it was through Instagram and it was actually through your car's account. So I can't wait to learn about you, your car, and your license plate story. Welcome, Joey. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's great to have you. Now, we are with you and your car because this is actually a story about a car as much as it is about you. So can you share your plate story about Mini Me Too? So uh, about going in the plate, I, I named my car Mini Me Too since this will be my second Mini that I have. And I first, when I saw my first Mini, I had personalized space. It was Mini Me. And then I... Didn't know at the time I sold the car with the plate. And then when I wanted to get that plate back to my second mini, it was already taken. So then I had to like, you know, try to find something. So that's what I ended up with mini me too, which for me is my second mini. So, you know, and was happy to get that plate. Now you are a lover of cars, but specifically minis. And I'm looking at the car in the video and it occurs to me that the steering wheel is on the wrong side of the car. So tell us a little about the origin of the car, how it came into your life and why you chose it. Well, I, it's, so first of all, I'm left-handed. So the car is, is four speed, it's right-hand drive, originally from England. I imported it actually, well, this car got imported to Miami and then I had it in the state here. And, and yes, I just love, somehow, I just love right-hand drive cars. And when I got into my first Mini, it was right-hand drive as well. It was red with the white top. And when it came around to get a second Mini, I wanted to look for the same color, red, to kind of like bring me back to my first Mini. And I ended up with, with the same car, almost the same car, and still right-hand driving is fun to drive. <laughs> a lot of people, when I'm driving it, all people, you know, they pull up next to me. They're like, whoa. Like, <laughs> they talk like I don't know you. I don't know that was, can you drive on the, on the wrong side? I'm like, yeah, everything you can, you can do it. But it's just kind of funny when you're making like right turns because you can see that curve right next to you. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so literally, you are making a right turn. You can see the sidewalk, all the curve when you make a circle. <laughs> At the beginning, it's kind of like, I would say it's kind of, kind of weird, but then I get used to it. You have and to get used to it, it sounds like, yeah. Because yeah. not all of your cars are right-hand drive. Oh, no, this is the only one, yeah. Yeah. It, I do have a, a, a big pickup truck, a big Toyota lifted pickup truck. So when I, I don't get this feeling anymore, but when we when went back to the Mini, I will actually drive my work truck, you know, lift it, you know, big wheels and all that, and then get into my mini to go for, you know, for a drive on it. And I'll be like, literally, I'm like, I feel like I'm in the ground because, you know, first of all, so small, it's like really small and then right hand drive. So it, it will throw me off a little bit and then finally I just got used to it. Now I can switch back and forth without having a, a difference. I don't see a difference anymore. I just got used to it already. You're like carlingual. Yeah, carlingual. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. Now I have to ask because it doesn't seem like it would be. Is it legal to drive a car with the steering wheel on the wrong side of the car? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it's a, it is legal. The only thing is you just have to, when you import cars like this, especially right-hand drives, it, the DMV and, and Highway Patrol give you a lot of uh, hassle, like how to, like, you know, to try to get it registered in your name, they make you go through a lot of stuff. And it's really, if the car is not registered in the state, it's really hard for for someone to get a car and, you know, have it go through the whole process of the DMV, put in it, you know, Especially California is really strict. Other states, they don't really, they're not as strict as California. California is really strict on importing cars. And not, not, not just right, but just importing certain cars, certain years. So I got a lot of friends, they have them, and they all, they, the Samini that they got all pumped up, they went and purchased Samini, and then they turn around like, oh, I, can, I can't register that vehicle in California. So what they do, they, they register out of state. With, they drive them, they have them here, but with out-of-state license plate, you know. So, but I mean, this is my second one. So I did all my homework on the first one. So when, I, when it came around to get in my second one, I already knew, like, what can you register in California? What, you know, all the stuff I had it all, all, all narrowed down. So Yeah, so, so you'd been through the process before. It was a little easier to do this time. Correct, yes. It was a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. Now, now this car, Mini Me Too, has its own Instagram account, Correct. and it's actually um, been it's it's like anybody in LA. It's a working actor trying to get um, famous. Get your it's fifteen minutes of fame, right? Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's what yes. I'm hoping for. Yeah. That's what you're hoping for, right? Um, yeah. So it's already appeared in a couple of different things. So where has it gotten some of its exposure so far? I in a, a company called Turtle Wax. They sell, uh, you know, products for vehicles and then photo shoot for them. And then also been in a couple of photo shoots for import magazines. The most of them, actually both of them were, were out of the, out of the, out of the state. They just contacted me through Instagram. They flew over, took some pictures of the vehicle, asked me questions. They wrote an article and yeah. And, wow. You know, Yes, but I'm still waiting for the 15 minutes of frame. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the car's in LA. It wants to be an actor. That pretty much tracks, right? Right. <laughs> and you're like the parent manager who's yeah, trying totally. to get it famous. Right. Yeah. You may as well be Britney Spears' mom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's awesome. So what would be the dream parts that Mini Me would love to do the most, like TV, movies. Probably like on a, on a like going through through the canyons, like I don't know, like maybe like kind of like a like a Italian job type of thing, you know, trying to get away, you know, because there are cars that they really known for taking canyons. The car sits really low to begin with, and the car just it sits in the canyons and they just on the turns they just. A little rocket in the canyon. Like say. a good getaway car. Yeah, yeah, like a good get getaway car, and a good you know you can hide the vehicle and pretty much in any in a little bush and you won't see the car. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Getaway, hideaway kind of car. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully, I'll be a catalyst in Mini Me getting his first big break in a movie as a runaway getaway hideaway vehicle. Yeah, I, hope I think so. that'd be a good part for him. Yeah. So we'll cross our fingers for know, him. Cross our fingers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Now this is an antique, right? What year is uh, the car? It's a 1963 Mini Cooper. Yeah. Wow, that's very very antique. It yeah, looks like it's in really good shape for being that age. In England, all the cars and all the snow and stuff, they, they're like the bumpers, the grill, the bumpers, the trim around the headlights, the handle, door handles, it's all stainless steel due to, so they don't get rusted over there. So then when, that, when, I, when I imported the car into the States, I actually took all the, all the stainless steel, because I figured if it's a classic car, it needs to have some shiny chrome, shiny paint job. So then I took, I stripped the car almost halfway on it and, and then just went through it and it just got all new parts, all everything chrome on it and wow. you know, the whole car and yeah. I went through it. I, I probably I put a I put a good decent amount of money on it. Yeah. 
So now he needs to earn his keep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now he needs to work. So he can pay off. <laughs> That's right. He needs to get to be get to work there, buddy. <laughs> Obviously, you have a love of antique cars and a love of the mini. Right. But it has more meaning for you than that. Can you share a little bit about his role in your life beyond your love of antique cars? Well, my daughter is a cancer survivor, and so I had a previous car that I wasn't even into it before this one. I just had it sitting in my garage, and then my daughter got diagnosed with leukemia. And when she got diagnosed with leukemia, our life just went upside down, and we we were been we were at that time we were married for eleven years, and you know we wanted to travel, wanted to purchase a home before we would have any kids. And then after 11 years, you know, my daughter came, she was healthy. And then at 18 months, she got diagnosed with leukemia. So we didn't even know what, I didn't even know what was leukemia. And then, I mean, just, we didn't have any support back then. And then, so I would come home, you know, she spent like almost three months in the hospital. So I would just come home and get clothes and we would take turns and going to work. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to take time out from work, my wife did, to stay with her. So I was going back and forth. And then when she was finishing up uh, trimming, then uh, I purchased this car and then I would just come in the garage and then, you know, I had the car in pieces. And kind of, it was kind of like my therapy to all that stuff, to trying to get some stuff. Because my friends will call me like, you know, how's your daughter doing? And I, I think if, if you don't go through it, you don't understand, like, you know, the whole process. So I would, be, I would just be to them, oh, she's fine, you know, she's she's doing good and that, that's something I didn't want to talk about it. And uh, so I would just come in the garage, turn my music on and just uh, just work on the car for a few hours. Sometimes I will stay until like two in the morning and then I'll have to get up at five in the morning to go to work. But that are kind of will help me get going through all this process. And that's kind of like how I started, ended up restoring it and, and, and now that now it means like more meaning to me, the vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. Because you had shared with me uh, that you guys were pretty isolated through the whole process. You couldn't really go anywhere or do anything that didn't involve the process of helping her get well. So that must have been really tough for you guys to manage that emotionally, to not really have that support system right. and to, to kind of go through it in isolation almost. Right, yeah. Yeah, and we, we did, we were, like, uh, like I mentioned to you, the doctor will be like, oh, she's fine, you know, you guys can go out to your friend's house, you, you guys can go out with her, you know, she's fine. And then as soon as we will do that, and she will spike a fever, and when they have a port, you know, if they get a fever, they go straight to the emergency, straight in, because they want to make sure that it's, the port doesn't get infected, because if it does, they don't have to do surgery. So there was there was hundreds of times where we ended up her immune system was really low. So it was a bunch of, like, probably over a hundred times that we ended up at the emergency hospital. I remember coming in and just the whole children's hospital waiting room was just completely uh, crowded. And we would just go right in and, and with her. So it's, it was really hard for us that, you know, what we went through with her, that we ended up pretty much isolating ourselves for almost, almost three years because the treatment is two and a half years. And we we'll still waited a little bit longer, and then then we started. My wife started uh, looking online, like support, like cancer support for kids, and then we ended up finding a childhood cancer foundation, which is called Max Love. They're based in Orange County. It's like a good, probably a good hour drive from where we from, from where we at, and so that's that's pretty much. So now we just she's fine now, and she's doing really good, and so we end up like right now. That's what they're gonna drive over there right now to to go with them, but we, we donate uh, a lot of my time, my wife's time, and then the same thing, they do classes to learn how to eat, you know, the stuff, after they went through cancer, you know, the certain, you know, certain foods, you know, you gotta stay away from and stuff, so they teach, they teach us how to cook, like, healthy food for them, so they don't, so they can thrive, yeah. That's wonderful that you guys have found a support system. I'm sorry it took you a long time and that you were really isolated in the process for a, a long time. Is that the organization that you have on your shirt? No, they stand up to cancer. As, as you know, they do, a, they do a show every two years. 
and she was she's also she's been on a, on a foundation called Saint Baldrick's Foundation, which they're based the the headquarters is here in our city. They were looking for for a kid that had gone through the process. So so long story short, she came out. We came out on TV. We went to the telecast in, uh, in Santa Monica for Send to Cancer. Wow. And they, they show kind of the, her story. They did a video of my daughter through the whole journey, like, you know, how she's doing and the whole process. Uh, people that don't know, you know, people think cancer is rare, but it's not, you know, for, for, for kids. They think that only uh, adults get cancer, but kids are also dying, you know, through different types of cancers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and you said that she's well now. Is she yeah. in remission? I'm not sure how leukemia works. Is that something you have to watch or is she outside of all of that? She's outside of all of that. We just have to watch what she eats. Like, you know, stay away from all the, from all the flowers and sugars because then she can, gain, uh, she can gain weight really easy. So we, we just, we'll, she's in like on a strict diet pretty much. So, I mean, due to taking, you know, chemotherapy for two and a half years normally uh, like a, a tumor or cancer six months and then you then and then you're good and then hers is leukemia is two and a half years wow yeah so it's a it, it went it was a, a long process yeah yeah but she's good now she's good now she's that's thriving. wonderful yeah she's, i'm happy yeah, to hear that so nine. how old is she now she's nine she'll be 10 in december it's, yeah. Wow. So, so she went through all that pretty young. Yes. Yeah. I, mean, I still remember the first day that when we ended up at the hospital and that she was being diagnosed or we're like, you, your daughter has leukemia. Well, we're like, what is that? And, you know, it's uh, something in her blood. If she might be, she might have a, a blood infection. If they did test. I'm like, no, you got the wrong, you got the wrong uh, child. That's not ours. That's, no, no, no. We already did the test twice you're going to get transferred to children's hospital wow and we'll tell you more and then that's when everything started and you know what we were the symptoms how did you know that there was something going on that needed to be tested so my wife works for a hospital usc the hospital here in southern california so we took it to the before we took it to the emergency we went to a, we were at a friend's house we just you know they were doing a barbecue and stuff and she was really active and playing and all of a sudden before that, a couple of days before that, uh, she was limping and she was like running and she was limping. Then she wanted to be held. We're like, okay, that's kind of strange. So then we looked at her like, we didn't see any bruises. We think maybe she fell, has a bruise on her leg. And then and then we kind of left it like that. And then that Saturday, I remember it was on a Saturday, we went to our friend's house. Then we were just having, you know, just having a good time. And then she was playing with the kids and it got to the point where she didn't want to walk anymore. And she was just complaining about her, her, her leg was hurting. So we looked at her again. So we decided to just take her to the hospital, an emergency. We took her. And then they were, they, they were like, oh, no, she's fine. This. And then my wife said, okay, I want you to draw blood. I want to make sure because that's not, you know, that's not normal. She's been complaining for the past. Right. Days. There's something going on. And then once they draw the blood, and that's when, they, that's when they, we found out she had that. So the symptom was... Uh, pain on her joints, and then also high fevers. And prior to that, she had maybe two, three weeks before that, she had high fevers, and we ended up taking her to the hospital to her regular doctor, and they gave her antibiotics. It kind of seemed to work, and it, it was like back and forth, but it, it, it went away. So that was also another sign, but we, you know, I mean, we didn't know when she was healthy, and yeah. nothing like that. So. Yeah, and it came out of nowhere, which I guess is really how cancer tends to show up, right? It just yeah. sort of comes out of nowhere. You're never yeah. expecting it. But I'm glad they caught it and they were able to treat her and to uh, yeah. make her healthy. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, you guys actually do some things to support other families so they don't have to go through that isolation and confusion that you had. Can you share a little about the work you do to support other families? Yeah, but we... Uh, we run into friends or, or friends' friends that they're in the process. So, uh, you know, we just kind of like coach them, just coach them and tell them like, oh, you know, you, you shouldn't be eating this. You should be put them on like on a diet. I know I remember a while back, it was about, like, about six months ago, we have a farmer market in our, in our town every Friday night. And I see this, this couple, this young couple that had a kid. And he was, he was bald. So I just asked him, you know, Hey, you know, is, is he okay? And they asked, they, they told me, yeah, you know, he's fine. He's in treatment. 
he had leukemia, and he has his drink in a Coca-Cola, which is really bad, you know, all this sugar. So then I just like went on the side and I, I told the, the dad and the mom, you know, I'm, I don't want to get, you know, I'm just, we went and then I had my daughter with me. So I told her she's a cancer survivor, she had leukemia, she's fine now. We didn't know at the time. So, I mean, I would suggest, you know, you know, look up this foundation, look up Max Love and also make sure, watch what you give them. Cause then, you know, cancer cells feed out of sugar. So I told her, you know, what is drinking, you know, he shouldn't be drinking, you know, especially a Coke, you know, you know, that's really bad for them. And then I, I connected them with, with Max Love and yeah, just friends or, or friends of friends. So from time to time, they call my wife and my wife will talk to them over the phone and then we'll meet them. Then we'll meet or, or we'll refer them to Max Love. We'll send them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's got to be hard, right? Like you see somebody on the street, you know they're doing something that's not, quote, good for you or good yeah. for their child. And now you have to sort of intervene and say, listen, this is not good. So, yeah. I mean, that's got to, that takes some courage to do that. But I really get that the courage comes from your commitment to have them have the same results that your daughter had and that you guys right. had. Yeah. A Coke is not worth the yeah. cost. Yeah. Right? That makes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. This point, even my daughter, she hasn't even tasted a Coke, to be honest. She's like water, really, when organic, if she wants to use, it has to be organic and it has to be certain ones. And yes, just pretty much just water. And, you know, we don't give her none of, no sugar drinks at all. Like she does, she does not eat chocolate. When, when Easter comes around, We'll, we'll do the extra eggs in the front yard and stuff. We fill them up with, with, with chocolates. And then we tell her, look, if you, if you get all these chocolates and put them, the tooth fairy will come and, and give you money. And then you yeah. can ask them for a choice. So she looks forward to that. Or even in Halloween, she does the same thing. The, the tooth fairy, she gives all the big pile of, of, of chocolates and candy bars. And then she asks for toys or you know, she asks for money. Most of the time, it's toys. So, I mean, it costs us more money to, to buy to buy all her all this expensive toy for her, but we rather we rather do that than her to be eating chocolate. I mean, after all these years, she's old enough to understand the cost that right. yeah. eating candy, chocolate, sweets could actually undermine her health. Right, yeah. so yeah. she gets it logically. I love that you're treating the uh, candy like green stamps, where you collect it and then turn yeah. it in for stuff, or like. When you go to Chuck E. Cheese, you get the tickets. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you turn them in for like a bear or whatever. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> Anything else you want to share about your daughter's journey or how it's impacted you or what you've been able to do and create as a result of it? I mean, we had a rough, like a rough beginning in the journey when she started. And thank God we got a good support. And thank to Max Love, we, you know, we learned a lot of stuff from them, how to cook. And to be honest, we're just keeping her watching on what she eats and yeah. healthy. Yeah. That's great. Well, I really acknowledge you and your wife for everything you have done, not just for her health, but the health of children, especially those dealing with life-threatening cancers like leukemia. Right. It's clear to me that you took all of your hardship and turned it into a gift that you could contribute to others. Well, I've really got just really enjoyed learning about your car and your life. And of course, hearing this journey about your daughter and what you guys all went through. It was a beautiful story. And it all came from, you know, you tagging your car vanity plates on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I always like to turn the tables and, and give you a chance to ask me one question. Do you have a question that you'd like to ask me before we wrap up? Well, it's, it's, Pretty cool. It's, it's, it's cool what you do. I mean, when you first contact me, I was like, I get all messages through Instagram for the car, like people from other country, like, oh, I'm traveling, you know, I'm going to be going to Los Angeles. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool what you do. So when you send me with that, when you send me the message, I was like, okay, I'm just going to respond and see. And then when I saw, when I saw what you do, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Thank, oh, thank you. you. Well, I wish you, Minnie Me, and of course your family, especially your daughter, a wonderful rest of the summer and a lot of health and love and success in all areas of your lives. Thank and you. I thank you so much for sharing your story. And thank you for sharing it. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Joey. Have a great day. Bye bye. You too. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Trista's Plate Story Podcast. 
please subscribe to Trista's Plate Story podcast to get the story behind all those vanity plates driving with you on the road. And if you would like to nominate the owner of a license plate, including you, or visit any of our partners and sponsors, come and see us at platestory.com. That's P-L number eight story.com and give us the details. If you enjoyed this episode, please drop a review and give us a share. I'm Trista Polo wishing you well on the road to your next adventure.